Join us for the Azure Cosmos DB Conference on April 19th and 20th. Azure Cosmos DB Conf is an online virtual event dedicated to our customers and community. Join us for three unique live streams in the Americas, Asia Pacific, and European time zones. Each stream will provide its own unique content, plus hours of great on-demand content too. Learn from others. Join in the conversation and take your knowledge to the next level. What's your favorite thing? Customers can build global scale apps easily and they just work. Instant and automatic scalability to handle unexpected with spikes in usage. It runs at five nines all over the world. It gives customers peace of mind their apps will be up. It's so versatile, as shown by the fact that virtually every Microsoft online service you can think of uses it. My existing MongoDB applications talk directly to Cosmos DB and get the best of all worlds. You only pay for what you use. Take the opportunity to learn from the others in the community who are using Azure Cosmos DB. Join us. Join us. Join us on April 19th and 20th. See you at Azure Cosmos DB Com. Don't forget to come back and view the on-demand content that you may have missed. Hello, good morning, good evening, or good night, depending on wherever on the world you are. Hi. Welcome back. Hi, Glenn. How's it going? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I'm happy to, uh, to be on the show, actually. It's been a long time. It has been a long time. This was the, first, the very first episode of this series was actually shot together with you. Absolutely. And now I'm back, so um, back for more. <laughs> back for more, very well. Um, so again, good morning, good evening, or good night, depending on wherever in the world you are. It is my pleasure, my absolute pleasure to have you here with us. And today we are joined by Glenn, my good friend Glenn, a fellow uh, Microsoft Azure MVP. Glenn, why, do, why don't you introduce yourself? So uh, I, I'm Glenn. I'm a Microsoft uh, Azure MVP. I uh, I work at a company called Jure. Uh, I'm mainly focused on on building scalable applications with Azure, focusing on platform as a service. And there, Cosmos DB is one of the the services I I use a lot in my day to day job. So um, happy to share a thing or two about that. And and uh, yeah, happy to be here. Definitely looking forward for that as well. And for those of you who don't know me yet, um, it means that you haven't seen any of the other episodes in our series, probably. My name is Alex. I'm a fellow at Microsoft Azure MP, just like Glenn here. Um, so Azure is my award category. Passionate about Azure, passionate about Cosmos DB. Definitely looking forward for continuing the Cosmos DB change feed conversation today, because the previous episode that we have had, Glenn, the other, the other week was on consuming the change feed and the various patterns and scenarios and concepts that ChangeFeed can actually uncover and unwrap. And today we're going to further discuss this topic with, with our audience and with you, particularly on mari the marriage between Azure Functions and, uh, and Cosmos DB. I'm really, really looking forward for that. Yeah, and, and uh, later during this show, we'll, uh, we'll show you a demo on, on the things on, on ChangeFeed and we'll basically work, uh, work further on the exercise of, of last week. But don't worry if you missed it. Um, it's a demo that starts from scratch. So uh, don't worry if you missed that episode. We, you will definitely be able to follow it uh, uh, through the show today. And we are also joined by Hassan, our good friend, who we have moderated several times with, and he also presented. Hi, Hassan. We, don't, we, we do know that we can, you cannot say hi back, but we're sure you do so. And Hassan will be our moderator today. So he will answer anyone's question. Remember, this is a live stream. This is a live session. For, so if people have questions, make sure to pop those questions in the, in the chat window, whether in your YouTube or Twitter or Twitch or LinkedIn, you name it, Microsoft Learn TV, wherever and whatever platform you're on, make sure to put, to put your name down, write whatever question you might have. Hassan will be more than happy to take them, as will we actually, because some of these questions will come to us as well and will be more than open and welcoming your for your for your questions and looking forward to receiving them now as usual we are actually here on, on a series this is a part of a uh, this episode is part of a larger series and the purpose of this episode today is to cover the one requirement the one exam objective on handling events with azure functions and azure cosmos db api change feed we are indeed following a microsoft learn module so if you want to learn more about these topics at your own pace, make sure that you head over to the Microsoft Learn module and you get ready for the exam, which actually begs the question, Glenn, did you take the exam yet? 
Yes, absolutely. I, I, I took the exam when it was still uh, still in beta. So uh, I uh, actually got my result, I think, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was a pretty uh, interesting and, and fun exam to do, actually. It, it tackles a lot of topics and it definitely tackles uh, change feed. So um, um, I, I would say if you're about to take the exam or planning to take the exam, uh, it, Change it if is definitely one of those uh, important things that will be handled during the exam and will you be uh, questioned questioned on. Well, so, I guess who better to moderate than with if you already took the exam and you know what you know the questions already. Are you going to tell us the questions? No, no. Ah. <laughs> that, that, that would that would um, that would ruin the fun of taking the exam, right? Yeah, definitely. Most likely, it will it would do so, but it definitely will not ruin the, the you know what will not ruin the fun. No, nope. <laughs> the learning experience that we're getting here. Every single episode, we learn more and more and more. And as I said previously, I'm following a Microsoft Learn module, but I would not urge people to actually unwrapping and starting that Learn module right now or going through it at uh, at the same pace that we are gonna go through. Because in all fairness, like in all of the previous episodes, we're going to show you a few tips and tricks, and we're going to show you some best practices, which might not be presented at the same level of detail as Microsoft module does. And with that in mind, we do encourage you to make sure that keep the question and the interaction going. We keep the questions coming because we will be more than happy to answer them. Remember, this is a live session. So why not start right now? Head over to the chat window, say hi, tell us where you're from. We're actually very interested in where, where, audi where our audience is because in one of the episodes, we have learned that you're literally everywhere around the world. So it might be close to midnight, <laughs> as it is in my case, or it might be some early in the morning. It doesn't matter. We all have a passion for Cosmos DB, and that's what brings us together today. Glenn, what are we going to cover today? What are so, our uh, as already mentioned, uh, the, the most important topic of today will be um, uh, how to create an Azure function uh, that uses the Cosmos DB trigger and uh, uses the, the change feed. So what we'll learn is, uh, first of all, we're going to take a step back and, and go back to the, the, the previous module. Uh, we're going to do some recap on what is actually change feed. Uh, so mm -hmm. to just uh, freshen up our minds and, 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 and see uh, so that we start all on, this, on the same level. Then we're going to talk about, okay, what is this Azure function all about and how, how does Azure function work with, with bindings and triggers and so on. And then uh, I think we're going, going to jump into a demo uh, pretty, uh, pretty early in, the, in this session uh, where we will yeah, basically start a, a, a function from scratch uh, where we will use the change feeds and, and, and create materialize you on, on, on data and then um, I think that will will bring us already uh, far in the show, and so um, I would say uh, let's go. Actually, let's do so. I'm I'm very keen on actually uh, going ahead and getting my head with the code, especially since you have mentioned that we're going to have some some code samples and demos early on. We're definitely going to keep not going to keep our audience uh, bored today, but rather they're going to be entertained probably. So let's last week. Let's yeah. hope so. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> we, we were going to do our best, right? <laughs> yeah. I, in, in my past, as a software developer, I've used Azure Functions several times. In fact, I've been a huge fan of Azure Functions ever since 2016 when they came out. And it was all about event-driven development, right? So this begs the question, and I would love to know what your thoughts are on this one. How does Azure Function fit in as a change feed processor maybe or whatever other compute model for for the change feed what's your take to it so um uh, as you function uh, as we mentioned it has a built-in um trigger for for cosmos db so it's really that better together story where you with uh, a couple of small uh, configuration settings you basically immediately can hook up in into the to the change feed for example uh, cosmos db trigger uh, uses the change feed to to trigger execution of that specific Azure function when there's uh, a set of changes to be processed uh, that happens on uh, the cosmos db so and it's it's actually uh, yeah a great way of an easy uh, to get going starting 
to to uh, to process all the changes on the change feed that is uh, that is uh, produced by uh, by Cosmos DB. So it's actually a better together story, in in my opinion. Um, so you're effectively particularly touching on the topic or the capability that your function has uh, with those built-in triggers, right? The bindings and the capabilities and whatnot. Because me as a soft developer, had I not had those bindings and those capabilities, I would find myself in the position of constantly having to write code and invoking and initializing clients and installing these libraries and that libraries and then keeping the libraries up to date, maybe updating some sort of a NuGet package, ensuring that I wrote the, the optimized code and patterns and whatnot. Yep. But with Azure Functions, because you have a trigger specifically targeting the Cosmos DB change feed, for instance, you don't have to worry about none of that. The only thing that you're going to provide is the connection string, and that's it, right? Yeah, you provide the connection string. You provide, of course, the the, the database name, the collection name, and you, of, of course. course, need to provide a uh, what is called a lease um, a lease, lease database yeah. or lease container. But we will definitely go, go into details on that. But as soon as you have that configuration set up. Uh, you're basically good to go, and you're focusing um, immediately on on processing the items. So you don't need any plumbing around uh, setting up connections or, or taking care of, of 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 anything else. No, you can Im immediately start working on those on those items that come in through the change feed. Immediately start focusing on yeah generating that that uh, that that business value. So and this so is what the um, yeah I think the 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 end goal of of the the module is so that uh, that we understand on how to create a function that is that is using that that Cosmos DB trigger and and consuming the change feed. So the big selling point here effectively is stop writing boilerplate code, right? You're speaking my language, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I say maybe let's let's dig in. Let's dig in. Let's let's deep dive here. We do have a part of our audience who might be completely new to our series. You might not have heard this before, or you might completely be new to change feeds. So that's that's absolutely fine. Stick with us. Uh, I think it's important to emphasize that Cosmos DB is a fantastically well suited platform for data persistency. Whether you're in the IoT industry, gaming industry, retail industry. Even if you only want to develop some sort of an operational logging application, that's fine as well. Cosmos DB is well suited for that. And one of the common design patterns in all of these applications is related to the usage of changes to the data on, for the purpose of triggering additional actions, right? So you might yeah. as well, you might, for instance, have a notification that or a call to an API when an item is inserted or updated. Maybe you want to have some sort of a real time stream processing for. IoT, maybe there's a sensor and you want to constantly stream data somewhere and then run real-time analytics processing on top on, on top of your operational data. Maybe you're interested in doing some sort of a data movement, such as synchronizing with, with a cache or a search engine or some sort of a cognitive service maybe somewhere. There, there, there's a ton of different scenarios that you can think of. And change feed is this capability that sits on top of all of these where you have like a persistent record of changes to a container in the order in which they occur. This means that change feed effectively supports Cosmos DB and works by listening to some sort of a container for any changes. So effectively, Glenn, if I would say, hey, here's some new data, there you have as a developer the ability of pulling whatever new item or new data that I've inserted or maybe updated at some point, right? What this means is that when you leverage the change feed of the container, which I manipulated, you get an output of which is like a sorted list of documents where changes occurred, and you're going to have that in the order in which they occurred. So you can yeah. think of all of these different scenarios that I have here on the slide deck, like event computing and, uh, and, and notifications. You can think of, for instance, stream processing, data movement. There's a ton of different scenarios. And in the previous episode, we actually elaborate these to an extent where we talked about how, you, how do you do uh, referential integrity? How do you leverage, for instance, uh, um, a, a data model in which you have multiple partition keys leveraged for the same data for the purpose of optimizing your queries, your reads, and your writes, and so on and so forth. And there's a ton of different scenarios you can think of. Do, do you have any scenarios that you could share with us, maybe from your customers, Glenn? Well, um, 
I think the 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 case where I use uh, change feed a lot was, uh, as already mentioned here, in those um, eventing uh, scenarios. Uh, we mm -hmm. had a, a case once where uh, we had a document stored in Cosmos DB, um, and there was one process that was updating that document, but that change need to needed to flow through different. Um, different uh, uh, downstream system or right. uh, other processing areas. And, and what we've did, we've leveraged um, change feed over there where uh, when a change happened on the document, the, the change feed picked up that, uh, that change. And then we pushed down the necessary changes to the downstream system um, in order to yeah, um, do uh, update certain uh, certain items uh, in in other uh, in other uh, uh, programs or downstream systems. So um, it's more like uh, in an eventing scenario where where this was used. Nice. So and and maybe important to mention um, is that uh, change feed uh, is available on uh, on all your uh, Cosmos DB account. It's enabled by default. So uh, that's there's nothing uh, special that you need to do. So it it is all you do. You don't need to provision anything, anything else. It is just it sits on your on your Cosmos uh, DB account. I think you already mentioned that uh, changes uh, come in the order that they've done. So we um, they literally uh, yeah. Uh, you can uh, work like with a stream of data on that. So uh, it's mm -hmm. important to also um, know that. And the change feed also includes um, uh, inserts and update operations made to, uh, all the, uh, to all the items in the container. So important there, it's, it supports the insert, but also uh, supports the updates on certain items. So you can also, if, uh, if an event gets updated, uh, you will um, you will also be uh, you will also get that uh, update uh, through the through the change feed. I think it's also worth mentioning here because a lot of people might ask themselves, okay, but if you want to use change feed, do you use it like from a single place or how does it work? And I think it's interesting to emphasize that you you have both the option of using change feed with Azure Functions or with a change feed processor, right? And this. So to an extent, tries to explain where Azure Function really fits in, because change feed, coming to think of it, is available for each logical partition within uh, within the container, and it can be distributed across one or more consumers if mm -hmm. you want to leverage parallel processing, just like you see here on this image, where we have consumer one, consumer two, consumer three, and well, God knows how many other consumers. Um, and I, I, I do appreciate that you emphasize that change feed is actually enabled by default for all the Cosmos DB accounts, as well as the fact that you can use your provision throughput to read from the change feed, just like any other Cosmos DB operation, really, in any of the regions that are associated with your change feed, uh, with your Azure Cosmos DB database. Now, um, I think you also mentioned previously that change feed actually includes insert and updates uh, operations. And they are actually there um, in the same order in which they actually occurred. They're in the mm -hmm. change feed as well. But I think it's also worth mentioning, Glenn, for our audience, that you can also capture deletes by setting the soft delete operation. A lot of database the developers do this, where rather than actually purging the data, they have some sort of an attribute where they say, yeah, we're going to delete this. Because from the change feed perspective, there this is going to be an update, right? We're just updating an attribute. So this is a soft delete. And this allows us to now capture the fact that we have deleted something that would also go to the change feed. Or alternatively, if you want, you could just say, yeah, we're going to set a finite expiration period using the TTL capability, the time to live. So for example, 24 hours, for instance, and then use the value of that property to capture the deletes. And with this solution, you have, the, uh, you have to process the changes within a shorter time interval than the TTL expiration period. But nonetheless, it is, it is another workaround that you could leverage. Any other scenarios you can think of maybe for change feed? Um... Not from the from the from the top of uh, from the top of my mind, actually. Um, maybe I, it's... I, I do believe, however, that when it comes to the scenarios that we implement, sometimes people do ask this question: um, Can you have change feed not pick up the question, not pick up the changes the moment that they occur, but maybe go back in time as well and pick them from the past? 
Um, I, I, there's a possibility as I, you can specify the actual start time uh, or the starting point where um, where you you want to start your your change feed, um, mm -hmm. and this is actually um, you can start uh, yeah you can start that to uh, from an initial starting point uh, as you wish, and um, actually what what it does is uh, and I think. Um, this um, this will also come back later. The the point on where your your change feed is um, uh, processing the data is stored actually within uh, within another container within within Cosmos DB. So you have a a, a separate uh, uh, container that will keep a point in time of where your um, where your state is stored on where your current processors are within within the change feed. So where are your consumers in the current in the current state change feed? Actually, yeah, that is actually very correct. The the, the thing about changes is that uh, as you have said, they're going to be persisted somewhere else, right? And this allows us to synchronize the changes from any point in time. There is mm -hmm. no fixed data retention period for which the changes would be available. And in fact, with that mindset, if you think about your uh, larger containers, the fact that the changes are available in parallel for all your logical partition keys inside the containers also means that if we have larger containers, we can process them in parallel by parallelizing, by scaling out the number of consumers that we have for, for, for all of these, uh, for a single container full of these partition keys, right? So applications can effectively request multiple change feeds on the same container and do this simultaneously. And then we have this change feed options start time property that can be used to provide the initial starting point. So for example, if you want to find like a continuation token corresponding to a given clock time, the continuation token, if you specify it, would take precedence over the start time and the start mm -hmm. before, uh, from beginning values that you'd otherwise set. And the precision of the change feed start time is roughly like five seconds or so, something like that, in case people are wondering. But there, there are a lot of, there is a lot of flexibility and there are a lot of different scenarios that are enabled by change feed and by implementing these uh, uh, processor options. The .NET SDK that we ended up using in SQL API, in, in, in the Cosmos DB SQL API, specifically referring to what we did the previous time, uh, did show us that the SDK actually ships with a change feed processor that simplifies the task of reading the changes from the feed. Of course, you could write your own wrapper. There's no shit about it. There's no doubt about it. But doing so would be counterintuitive when you have such a fantastic SDK, in my opinion. Um, what has to be remembered, especially if you're com completely new to change feed, is that there are four main components of implementing the change feed processor. One of them is the monitored container. Effectively, what data do we want to be notified about, like changes being generated, where do we generate them from? Any inserts, any updates to the monitor container will be reflected in the change feed. The second one is the lease container. The lease container always acts as some sort of a state storage and coordinates the processing of the change feed across multiple workers. So the lease container can be stored in the same account as the monitor container, but it might as well be in a completely different account, which means that you can get isolation, you can get isolation of the uh, are used utilized. You can even process them faster in a location that is different from the location that you actually um, uh, monitor the container with. Maybe you have some virtual machines laying around somewhere else, right? Or maybe you want to write, write your or develop your processor on premises. So you want your change feed to be much closer to your on premises location rather than being at wherever else your Cosmos DB account is at. Similarly, a third component is the host, which is like the compute instance host that a change feed processor would listen for changes to. And depending on the platform, again, this could be a virtual machine, could be a Kubernetes spot, could be an app service instance, an actual physical machine, you name it. And then last one, Glenn, what do you think the last component is? So yeah, the, the delegate is actually uh, part of the code within, within, the, um, within the client application that will implement your business logic um, to, uh, to implement or to act upon the the changes within the within the change feed, so it's the the delegate is actually the code or what you as 
the developer, architect, or consumer of the change feed want to do with, with the batch of changes that your, your processor feed is, um, that uh, your processor is, is reading. So um, important there is um, prior to using the change feed processor, uh, you uh, should definitely create that lease container um, that you will will reference. I, I, I don't believe that was expl explicitly mentioned, but it's important that that lease container is is definitely there within your within your Cosmos DB. We will show you. I think it's it's part of the demo. Um, there's a little trick within uh, within Azure Functions to say, okay, when the lease container is not there, uh, uh, I probably forgot to. Um, to add it um, uh, in my in my bicep file or in my automated deployment. If it's not there, just create it uh, um, uh, automatically when when the function is is uh, is starting up. Absolutely, and spot on 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 the delegate there. Now, if we want to further understand how all of these four components and elements of the change processor mm -hmm. work together, here's an example uh, in the, in this diagram. We have the monitoring container storing a bunch of documents, potentially looking at city as a partition key. And we see that the partition key values are always going to be distributed in ranges that contain items. There, there are two compute instances in this scenario, at least, and the change feed processor is going to assign different ranges of partition key values to each instance for the purpose of simply maximizing the compute distribution. And each instance, therefore, would have like a unique and a different name. So each range is being read in parallel, and its progress is going to be maintained separately from the other ranges in the lease container. Cool. Um, what about maybe unwrapping really, 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 really quickly Azure Functions, especially yeah. for the purpose of bindings with Cosmos DB, Glenn? Yeah, so um, I think Azure Functions uh, is, a, a function, is a service within, within Azure that um, that is basically uh, our the serverless offering. Actually, uh, uh, it just runs uh, pieces of code uh, on demand, and it's um, it's used. Uh, I, I I'm I don't want to say microservices, but it's it's more like building blocks that you can hook up together uh, to build a more complex uh, solution, and there more, uh, let us say, event-driven reactive programming in, 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 in nature. They are usually triggered by a, an action and they do something with that action or do something with that, with that input. And then they return that to an, an output. Let us say, for example, uh, a trigger can be uh, a timer trigger. For example, a function can run um, Every five minutes, uh, it can read uh, as an input from a SQL, do something with it, and output it to, to Cosmos DB. And that's just a small piece of code that runs uh, that runs your, your business logic and can have some inputs uh, and, uh, and outputs and is uh, triggered by uh, something happening, whether it is a um, HTTP call, a message from IoT Hub, a service bus topic trigger. Uh, in our case, it will be, of course, um, the change feed um, uh, processor. I do want to clarify because this serverless term uh, is a bit abused. It is a marketing concept. Of course, there are servers involved, right? There's no doubt about it. Uh, but it is serverless because just like you've mentioned, Glenn, it is reactive in nature, right? We, yeah. we do usually call this, or common literature other calls it, event-driven development, where something occurs, like you've mentioned your example with a, a timer-based trigger, time passed, right? Time passed, enough time has passed for the event to execute once more. But it is serverless in nature because we don't pay for servers, we pay for execution. So each time your function executes, you're going to be billed. Um, I actually did the, 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 the math once based on the uh, pricing calculator and the actual prices. I believe that I might be wrong, but depending on the region where you're at, you're, you're, where you're, at, you're paying roughly two cents for the million of execution. So if you do the math, there's going to be a lot of executions you have there. But of course, there are some caveats. It, yeah. Each execution is counted towards one second and one, point, one gigs of internal memory utilization and stuff like that. So um, th there are a few, few details there. 
Yeah, and if I'm if I'm not mistaken, to emphasize a bit on the on the pricing part, I believe the first one or two million executions are totally free of charge. Oh, okay, um, so you can you can even get to a cost which is less than a cent. <laughs> yeah, that would be a great challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> what did you spend today on the on the expensive cloud pesky thingy well 0 0.15 cents <laughs> i know uh but let's not talk pricing let's rather talk about yeah. our favorite topic now which is cosmos db and azure functions because there are some very interesting um opportunities here thinking about azure functions and change in particular you have mentioned previously microservices in the context of functions and in all fairness Microservices are meant to be small, right? That's the micro part in the in the terminology. And functions are definitely small on one end, or they should be small at least. And similarly, they are designed to have a single responsibility pattern design, right? Which is all about the S and the solid principles for microservices. So the idea is that the way we think about Azure Functions is that we think of it as a service offering these serverless blocks of code running logic on demand, right? Because it's event driven. And they are often the building blocks of a more complex solution and are therefore reactive, as you have said, right? So the idea is that each time a function starts with some external event, we call that the trigger, it indicates that the function should start, right? The trigger does that. And many triggers also include a payload for the function to process. And Azure Functions has a bunch of triggers for various cloud services that are fully built in. Right, that this is that this is the reference that Glenn did previously when he mentioned that you don't have to write your own code. Rather, you just bring in a trigger of sorts, like a Cosmos DB trigger, and from that point onward, you just write a single database reference, a contain reference, and a connection string, and you're done. Um, so a lot of the heavy lifting related to writing boilerplate code is taken away from you. So a function, as you have mentioned, can also contain an input, um, and this input would be there to what provide you more data, I guess, Glenn. Yeah, so um, you, your input is um, providing you with more data after the function has already been triggered. So your uh, your initial uh, starting point or the, um, the 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 yeah the trigger to to start your function is the actual uh, function's trigger. So and but the endpoint the input binding will read uh, one or more items. That uh, that brings in additional uh, data within within your function. So the input binding actually happens after the trigger. So and that uh, the inputs can uh, yeah, as already mentioned, pull in additional data um, within your function, which you can do uh, modifications on, run your basic logic on, and then uh, you bring that. Uh, you do those executions, and then you can write that to an output binding, uh, basically indicating uh, where your Azure function should uh, send its response to. So yeah, absolutely, uh, and you also have along the same lines an output, right? I would imagine that you could have these as um, probably a log of sorts. Every time something happens, you output the, to a log. Um, the, the steps that your function took and maybe some sort of a more verbose log would tell you each function um, method that was called or whatever steps that you went through, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in Cosmos DB, uh, uh, to, to, to take back to the initial topic of, of, this, of this session, Cosmos DB supports all, all the three types of, of these bindings. So first of all, the trigger, uh, as already mentioned, it will... Uh, use the change feed uh, as a starting point for your function. As uh, the input, uh, you can read, uh, read items from Cosmos DB, bring them into your, your Azure function. And then as the output binding, you can um, write items uh, or one or more items to, uh, to a container when, when necessary. So um, here, uh, this is, um, this is uh, a demonstration of, okay, how how flexible uh, functions and how good uh, functions and Cosmos DB work together with those triggers, input and output bindings without having to write, again, boilerplate code. Absolutely. Maybe it's a good time to think and elaborate more on these bindings. When, when I have 
worked with bindings in the past, when I was configuring them, I usually used this JSON configuration within my host files, and, oh, sorry, my function JSON files, which is a configuration file for all the bindings within the function, right? And this contains, well, the file itself, a JSON object with a property named bindings, which is an array, of course, for your trigger, your input, and your output bindings in particular. But I think it is worth mentioning that to configure an Azure function to use, say, the Azure SQL database API binding, you should first create an API setting in the function instance will contain the connection string for of the Azure Cosmos DB account. And if you're using the Azure portal, obviously you can do this. Um, this can be done automatically on your behalf. But once you have the application setting on the connection string, you could effectively, for instance, just make sure that uh, you have that Cosmos DB SQL con uh, SQL connection string already configured in the database instance uh, to be whatever connection string you, you would require it to be. Now, of course, there are a lot of different configurations possible within this JSON object. Uh, and this table contains some of them. These are the configurations that we would have for trigger ring a, based on a, a Cosmos DB SQL API. Um, so we have the type, the name, the direction, the connection string setting itself, the database name, the collection name, the lease collection name, the create lease collection, if not exists. Um, this is, I believe, the property that you were referring to previously, isn't it? the Boolean value that would indicate that you must create a container for, for the lease collection um, yes. on behalf of the code if it doesn't exist. Yes. So, nice. Now, here we have an example of a trigger that would monitor the changes in Cosmic Works, which would be a database that is called, obviously, that. And it would contain a container called Products, which is included in this trigger as a relevant information as well. So the trigger effectively will use the change feed for the purpose of monitoring if new items are created or if existing items are ever going to be updated. And this trigger will start a function where there, when there is a new batch of items to process um, the, from, from the change feed directly. So with this new thing that we have learned, I think it's now relevant to say that the bindings array can optionally also have multiple input bindings within the array. Can you maybe tell us an example when you'd want to have multiple inputs except for the trigger? Because the trigger clearly tells you that, hey, you have some new data, right? Why would you need an additional input for that? Um, for example, uh, if you have uh, additional data that you need to pull in for la from like a, a SQL database or a uh, or anything else, so it's it's really um, again allowing you to uh, to bring in all the necessary data that you have. So. Your, your change feed here, if if it has if it brings in changes on a certain document, uh, and you want to bring in uh, additional uh, reference data from that specific document, you can uh, use that. Um, you can bring in that data uh, within the within the input binding. So you have both the uh, the data from SQL and your other store or your other uh, input uh, uh, value or item that you need in order to do further um, to do further um, processing uh, uh, upon that. So you can even run a SQL query within, within that input binding and then possibly return multiple items to, to, to bring in into your, to your function. And the input parameters that you're referring to can take in the value mm -hmm. uh, which would be the pro one of the properties of the trigger, right? Absolutely. From whatever triggered that. So if you have a new document that is triggering your function and whose identifier is also going to be utilized as a file from a storage account, you could have an additional input that targets to your storage account and pulls the file where the file name, the blob name is that identifier, for instance. And that might as well, I don't know, be a picture of somebody and your data in Cosmos DB is not the picture, but rather the metadata of the picture that you just added. So this could trigger an Azure function where we take the picture in as an input, and then maybe we're processing that picture, that image, using Cognitive Services, for instance. And voila, you have already implemented the fantastic microservice, if you think of it like that. <laughs> Good job. Great. Um, so your input bindings, they, you've just mentioned, they can be two things, right? They can be your SQL queries, which 
obviously give you a large amount of data back based on your SQL query or a point read. Point read is effectively reading something based on the partition key and the identifier, super quick operation, mm -hmm. going to consume the minimum amount of RU possible. So point read input binding uses the items unique identifier and the partition key value to perform the quick read operation. And this configuration object would differ, therefore, from the trigger with a few changes to the properties. Uh, number one, the property would contain like the type, that is the um, input binding uh, having a static type of Cosmos DB, always at all times, um, a direction, an identifier, and the partition key. And these are going to be probably a no-brainer, and everyone will understand where they use how they're being utilized. An example of such an input binding that reads an item with whatever GUID as an identifier and the partition key of whatever other GUID uh, could effectively be uh, one that you'd configure in a JSON and you're specifying there your database name, your collection name, may that be Cosmic Works again, because we've used this database in so many examples so far, and then products as your collection name. And you just specify the additional um, name items, the direction, the connection string, and you're pretty much done. And if you want to utilize a SQL query as an input binding, then you, well, pretty much forget about all of the other properties and just use a SQL query property that is the actual query to look up the multiple items with. And we have here yet another JSON example um, that explains or elaborates on that purpose. So with that SQL query property, you can, for instance, specify select PID, P name, P category ID from products. Products is going to be aliased with P where the P price is going to be higher than 500, for instance, which means that every time the trigger is going to fire the execution of the function, we are also going to execute this query and retrieve all of those items which are um, higher than, whose price is higher than 500. And then finally, the bindings array includes an output binding to configure pipelines to send data to other application components or cloud services. I do really do appreciate this mindset of abstracting away the inputs and the outputs plan. I don't know about you, but the fact that I don't have to install those Nougat packages, which get updated so often, the fact that I don't have to initialize um, my, my own clients, the fact that I don't have to worry as much about dependency injection, for instance, and I just use these bindings, input outputs and the trigger bindings, of course, makes development so much easier. Absolutely, and I think we we've already uh, touched that point a lot. It it just takes away a lot of that boilerplate code where you just have to uh, uh, take care of database uh, or, or or data connections and stuff like that. Here within function, you just use that output items uh, output items uh, array, and then you um, you uh, yeah. You program against that, and then you're you're basically good to go. And magically, uh, data appears within within your uh, output um, uh, database or Cosmos DB or whatever you specify as an output. So it's it's really great, uh, as you mentioned, to 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 use that. And it's it's uh, it's very simple to use. It's the um, here we're talking about um, specifying. Uh, JSON objects, but uh, during the demo, you will see that these, even though that this JSON object is being abstracted away uh, for you when you're using uh, Visual Studio Code or just uh, Visual Studio, uh, and, and it's just uh, uh, easy and, 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 and great to use, actually. We're, we're not calling any favors or favorites here. But Glenn, which one do you usually use? Is it Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code for? I'm, 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 uh, I'm going on a slippery slope here, but I'm, I'm still an, an old school guy. I'm, and I'm uh, still a big fan of, of using uh, Visual Studio. Um, um, but yeah, that's that's just me being being old, I guess. <laughs> I, I wouldn't call you old, man, and I definitely wouldn't say that you're on a slippery slope. Visual Studio is still one of the most, probably among the best, if not yeah. the best ID, in my opinion. I've used it myself for over two decades now. I still use it on a regular basis, but I must be honest, when it comes to Azure Functions, I actually do use Visual Studio Code. Um, there was a bit of getting used to it at first, but it is just a fantastic product. It's so lightweight and it just works hand in hand with Azure Functions. Um, cool. And talking on that, on that, uh, uh, this is a good segue actually to how do we actually develop functions? All now right. we are going to show you some code. 
we are going to show you some some bindings. We're going to show you how everything works. But Glenn, maybe you want to share a screen and actually develop a function, and then we're going to come back and dissect everything, unwrap everything, and see and show show our audience how it gets done. So let me uh, take in and, and zoom a bit here. So uh, we're actually in Visual Studio right now. We will definitely uh, jump into Visual Studio code later uh, during, this, uh, during this demo. But what we will do is we will create an Azure function to consume the, uh, the Cosmos DB uh, change feed. And what I've done is uh, I've installed the, the necessary tools, of course. Uh, I've uh, already created a, um, an example uh, uh, project that you can see here on the, on the right-hand side. But what I do wanted to show you is um, there is a possibility when you create a, um, a new function uh, within, within Visual Studio, within Visual Studio Code, you can uh, start from what I say, uh, some, uh, some pre-built templates. And in our case, what we're going to do is we will use the Cosmos DB uh, trigger template. And you will see here immediately that you need to provide a connection string name. You need to provide a database and a, and a collection uh, to work on that. Similarly, for example, uh, and now, now I'm, I'm jumping uh, topics, if you want to like, a work with, with IoT Hub, you need to provide a connection string over there and you need to provide your path. And once you, you, you take this, you will basically run through this wizard. And what will happen is um, the function will be provided for you. And let me immediately jump back through, uh, let me just close down this uh, window. What, let me just close this one. What will happen is, this will create a, a, a function for you um, ready to, to start, uh, start uh, implementing. Mm -hmm. So, and if you would, uh, if you would go uh, to, your, uh, to your newly created function, you will see a um, local uh, settings and you will see a DB connection there. And this is actually just the name uh, I've provided uh, as the, the database connection. And what I need to put there is my uh, Cosmos DB uh, key, so the connection string to my uh, to my Cosmos DB. So let me. Uh, and go. just for brevity, everything is yeah. brand new, right? You you just selected something from the template, and based on the template, Visual Studio scaffolded and created on your file system a bunch of files in accordance to the type of triggers that you wanted and the type of yeah. scenario that you want to implement, and so on. Yeah, and, and this is what I've mentioned with um, with the uh, the abstraction away of the of the whole JSON. So you see here that uh, Visual Studio uh, created this this Cosmos DB trigger for me. Uh, mm -hmm. This 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 annotation. So uh, and this has all the necessary configuration here for me to work with uh, with the Cosmos DB uh, change feed. So I mm -hmm. did not write any code yet. Uh, it's just there for me uh, to start using. Uh, so uh, if I would jump to the portal, let's jump to, um, to the Azure portal. And what I will do is I will go to keys and I will grab the connection string here. And what I will do is I will uh, copy paste this in my, uh, in my settings file. So if you're quick enough, you could also grab that um, um, that uh, connection string um, in in regular cases we will we would probably get that connection string from from a service called key vault but yeah. uh, for for the uh, for the ease of, of the demo let's let's keep it uh, this way. So um, what we will do is um, here is we will configure the uh, our our Cosmos DB trigger, and if we will uh, take a look, it's we will need to provide a database name. If we would uh, go back, um, we need a database name and a collection name. Excuse me. So we have our store database and our card container by uh, state. So if we would go jump to the data explorer. 
you will see here that we will use the store database with a card container by state. So, and what we'll actually do is um, we will uh, implement what is called a, a materialized view pattern. And um, materialized view pattern is, uh, is used to pre-generate and pre-populate views of, of data in environments where, where the source data is not well suited uh, in regards to your application uh, in, environment. For example, data flows in into a certain format, but you want to um, uh, output it or display it in a UI or, or anything else in, a in, an, in another format. And this is where material uh, materialized view pattern comes into play, where you actually uh, take the, the input data, uh, do some uh, aggregations on top of it, uh, uh, and then uh, store that result of that aggregation um, in a separate container, and then uh, use that container with that aggregate aggregation, excuse me, to uh, serve your, your application. So your application would not read the initial uh, input of data, but they will use or connect to the material, materialized data already pre-processed or uh, aggregated uh, uh, in, in our case. The, so the, scenarios, our case, the scenarios sorry. around materialized view actually are, are quite a lot. And one, one that really si sits well, in my opinion, related to NoSQL is referential integrity. More often than not, in the first episode that we did, maybe the some some part of the audience will remember, we talked about data modeling with Cosmos DB. And back in those days, we referred to the different queries we would write. And depending on how you partitionize your data and how you pick your partition keys, we could effectively optimize on the RU consumption. And therefore, we could even optimize on the number of uh, consumers that can currently query our data from Cosmos DB because we know the partition key, we know how to how to read only from a single partition rather than scaffold and then uh, uh, fan out that that we to multiple partitions that would negatively impact our 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 u so for instance one thing that you should never do in NoSQL is if you're trying to query all your products that you have in your catalog and you have the product category as an information for your products in the relational world you would have an identifier and you would join with the products category table to pull the category information. In the NoSQL world, the concept of join does not exist, so you want to stay away from that. So rather, you would have your container with documents representing products, and for every product, you have the information that has to be visually uh, presented somewhere, maybe on a web page, related to the category as well. So the category name and whatever other information about a category would be part of the information, the JSON, on every single product. This sounds um, like super, super, super dubious for somebody who is coming from a relational world. But in NoSQL, this is the right way to do it because storage is cheap. In the relational world, storage was expensive. Now, the problem that comes in here is that if you ever go to your product's container and you say, I'm going to update this category name, sorry, the product's category container, and you update the product's category name, now you need to go through every single product and update that name as well. And you don't want to do this on a single HTTP call, on a single request where you're saying, yeah, we're going to update something. No, you want to do this in the background, asynchronously. So you're going to put, you're going to push one update through change feed from your product's category container. And that's going to be picked up by a consumer. And that consumer is going to go through every single product in the category and just update the information, right? That's the right way to do it. Yeah. So, um... I want to just emphasize here on the on the different uh, containers that we have. So we have card container, card container by state. We have the the lease container for console and the, the state sales uh, there. I, I want to uh, jump back to a, a topic, uh, something we've mentioned during the beginning of of, of this talk is um, you need something what is called a lease container and. What we have is our lease collection for the um, for the demo that we're doing is called materialized view leases. So you've noticed that that uh, container was not there. 
So what we will need to do is, uh, and we, we gave it away during the, um, to the JSON configurations, is what we will do is um, uh, just uh, add this to our, our, our piece of code. If just, uh, if the lease collection uh, uh, container is not there, just, uh, just create it. So, so we set that to true in order to, um, to have that uh, that container uh, uh, created. Um, so what we um, so what I will uh, also do is um, I will uh, change the um, will make the the function uh, asynchronously um, in order to to do some uh, some work on that. So uh, in order to, to return a, a, a task uh, and so on. So what we will do next is, okay, uh, to mention uh, um, this is, we will continue our work from, uh, from previous demo. So uh, um, we will run what is called, let me jump maybe then to Visual Studio Code, is during the previous round of this, um, of this uh, session, what we've done is we uh, used the the change feed uh, uh, console. So we've used the change feed processor uh, here in order to work with with the change feed. So and what we will do here is we will build further upon that, or we will do a similar exercise today where we will not use the the change feed processor, but will consume the change feed with um, with Azure with Azure Functions, and what we will also do is we will use the data generator. So what the data generator will do is uh, the data generator will start uh, adding data towards our Cosmos DB, and that will trigger our um, will trigger our uh, change feed in the end, and then it will start um, uh, processing uh, processing uh, data. And in hey, the buddy, end, before you get started, can I can I give you a pro tip for next time? You probably want to change your font to Cascadia Nerd Font, which is a free open source font that people can find. Scott Hensman actually did a video on customizing uh, the terminal, and they do see that you're missing some some Unicode. Yeah, there. I, I, I just people know can reach out to us on Twitter if they want to learn more about it. But this is this is something that just popped into my eyes now. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> um, so what we'll do is I will jump back to my um, to my uh, example here, and what I will do is uh, I will just create a um, I will copy some uh, code that was prepared here, and what will I I will do is I will use the same uh, endpoint URL and primary key. Uh, that is the connection towards my um, towards my Cosmos DB account, and you will see here that um, let me jump back to here. Um, we'll add the NuGet package over here. You will see here that we will uh, initialize the the Cosmos client, and we will uh, use this to. Um, to work with with the state sales and our state sales are is actually the um, the materialized view that we've we've talked about uh, and if we are going to take a look at uh, the state sales container what it actually contains is it contains the the state uh, it contains account of the and a total. Uh, Total uh, sales, so it contains a, a count on how many times the this has updated and how many sales there there have been. So um, our change feed um, our change feed function will actually uh, use this um, state sales con um, um, container and update those those sales um, uh, those sales as as we go. So what we need is, um, of course, we need a um, a model that works with that. So let me just uh, uh, 
uh, at that. So here again, this is a model that represents the, um, the state count of the um, of the the object that's within our, our cosmos db so you see the id the state the count and the total sales so this is uh, representing the the item that we will add to our uh, to our um, to our uh, cosmos db uh, item so let me just uh, save uh, that for you nice all right um Next part is, um, so with this, uh, Azure Function will receive a list of documents that you will see here that has uh, that have changed. So um, uh, during our demo, we want to organize um, this list into uh, a dictionary with uh, with the key of, of the state of each document and keep track of that total price and the count of the item uh, purchase. So uh, we will use that dictionary later to write uh, data to a materialized view. So what we will do is I will just um, take code to... Um, to take in the, the value of that, um, to do the, the necessary actions on, on the dictionary. So if it's per, if, uh, if it's not purchased, we will just continue. And then uh, we will make sure that the dictionary contains the, 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 the state. If not, we will just continue. Next to that, um, what we will do is, um, we will uh, initialize the connection to our um, to our container. So, uh, in order to work with that, you use the Cosmos client to get the database, and then uh, from the database you get a specific container. So, in our case, the container ID is our state sales where we uh, keep the materialized uh, view. So. Uh, because we're dealing with uh, an, an aggregate collection, uh, we'll be either uh, updating the document or creating a new entry. So um, what we need to do is uh, we need to add uh, specific code uh, to, first of all, uh, check if, um, if the item exists. If it does not exist, uh, we will do an, uh, an insert. If it, uh, if it doesn't exist, we will just do a, an update. And let me just um, pull, in, uh, pull in that code, and then we can, uh, can quickly uh, run through that, through that code. So here again, uh, as you can see here, um, for, uh, for the... Uh, what we will do is uh, we will query the state uh, from our uh, from our Cosmos DB. So if it's if it's there, if it's already um, uh, exists, we will uh, do an, an update of the count. So we have uh, visited that item x amount of time, and then we will update the, to the total sales. And in that case, we will just uh, continue to. Um, to update the, um, the materialized view. So what I will do now is I will jump back to Visual Studio Code uh, with my, um, my fonts that apparently are not installed. <laughs> um, I have to say in my other console, they, they should work perfectly. So there's definitely something wrong uh, yeah. at, at my end. Uh, uh, just as a side note, I do have <laughs> correct fonts installed. So let's tell me um, some questions from the exam, and I'll tell you how to fix it. <laughs> yeah. <thanks. laughs> so let's uh, jump to the data generator here, and then do a, uh, a .NET run, and you will see here that it will um, that it will start uh, generating uh, data. What I will do next is I will um, start another terminal 
And as a matter of an example, what I will do is um, I will uh, open the change feed uh, console that we've uh, we've built last week and do another uh, do another .NET run. And you will see here that um, as data is being generated, this should work. Um, okay, so the change feed processor is start. You can see here that changes are being processed by our change feed um, uh, processor we've built last week. Nice. So, um, and if all goes well, uh, this is our function example that we've just built up um, um, today. And if I uh, if I fire this up, if all goes well. And whilst this guy is loading, I think it's important to say that even though you're not running inside an actual Azure function, you're using the function CLI to emulate how the application would work had it run inside a function, right? Yeah, so this is uh, just running on my local uh, local machine, but connecting to the change feed uh, within within Azure. Uh, I so let me see if I can zoom this a bit. So you can see this is uh, starting up, and uh, we should see some changes uh, popping in. So you can see here uh, the uh, execution is done. You can see here that it's starting to absurd that uh, that materialized view and actually listening on that that change feed that is that is coming in very nice so, and if if we would then jump to uh, cosmos db then and if we would uh, bring in a particular document you would see that some of these documents will start so <clears throat> this pr used to have uh, five sales have been increased let me see if we're lucky enough to get another one going. Um, so this will uh, start um, just updating that that those documents that materialized view uh, as we go. And as you can see here, uh, I want to emphasize on 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 the the most important part is the the input binding. So what we've done in order to get data from that um, from that change sheet is just specify the connection string to Cosmos DB, and then have the database name, collection name, and our lease collection name. And then we, right. we're ready to go to work on the input documents. Very nice. Great job, then. I think we That's can it, take right? it back to the slides, right? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Because, I mean, this was this was definitely a longer demo. You went through all the details and you elaborated very nicely every single step that you had to do. But I think you proved a fantastic point, which is if you decide to leverage Azure Functions, every time there are changes, especially if you have sporadic changes to your code, you're going to minimize down on the actual consumption power that you need to leverage and to utilize to, to pull in those changes. Or similarly, if you want to simply have reactive development done, Maybe you're changing some models. Maybe you're thinking about new new containers and new database, new collections. Then you can just hook up another function and listen to change same change feed, right? So it's all about the ease of development and focusing so hard on your business logic and your business use case. But on that bombshell, I would also want to focus a bit on maybe some best practices for implementing Azure Functions because I've seen this implemented at several customers, and sometimes there are some performance tips that they, um, well, let's say forget about. Sometimes there are some, some scenarios which need troubleshooting. And this is definitely not an exclusive or exhaustive list. This is some of the tips that we, we came, uh, came up with based on the prior experience that we have had with Azure Functions, Cosmos DBs, and so on. For instance, I would start off by saying that you should always avoid long-running long functions because these large, long-running functions, they can cause unexpected timeout issues. Um, a function can become large because you have many Node.js dependencies or because you're importing dependencies, which can also cause increased lead times that result in unexpected timeouts. I mean, dependencies in general, they're not good, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They're loaded both explicitly and implicitly in Azure Functions. And the single module loaded by your code may load its own modules. That's why we say with implicit loading. So whenever possible, you should refactor large functions into smaller function sets that work together and return some responses super fast. For example, you could have like a webhook or maybe an HTTP trigger function that might require an acknowledgement response within a certain time limit. 
it's common for webhooks to require an immediate response. So you can pass the HTTP trigger payload into a queue to be processed by a queue trigger function, for instance. And this approach lets you just defer the actual work item and return an immediate response instead. Similarly, cross-function communication. I'm sure people have heard, and Glenn, you definitely did as well, about Azure Logic Apps or durable functions. It's all about workflows and putting stuff together, right? And these can be built to manage state transitions and communications between multiple functions together. And if you're not using durable functions yet, you should. Uh, but if you're not using them yet, to, or even Logic Apps to integrate with multiple functions, it's best to use maybe a storage queue for cross-function communication. Do some stuff in a small function. Remember, not long-running functions, but smaller is better. And then just offload the result to a queue and pick it up from another function, for instance. The main reason is that storage queues are cheaper and much, much, much easier to provision than other storage options. Um, you should write your functions to be stateless and remain stateless. By nature, Azure functions should be stateless. And functions should be stateless and idempotent, if possible. This is a very difficult word. I depotent. This effectively means that every time they execute, the outcome is going to be this, uh, the same. It, the outcome doesn't change unless the actual state changes, the input cha uh, changes as well. And you should obviously associate any required state information with your data. So for example, if you have an order being processed, uh, that would likely have an associated state member. So a function could process an order based on the state while the function itself remains stateless. Either mm -hmm. potency is a very important nature for functions, and that the potent functions are especially recommended with timer triggers. For example, if you have something that an absolutely must must absolutely run um, once a day, you should write it so that you can run any time during that day with the same result. The function can exit when there's no work for a particular day, but at the same time, if a previous run failed to complete, the next run should pick it up where it, where where the work has been left off. This actually brings me to another interesting topic, which is writing defensive functions. I sometimes tell my customers, hey, you should write defensive functions. And they're like, uh, so what do you mean by that? Do I need to install an antivirus? Or what do you mean by defensive functions? Uh, it's none of that, actually. It's assuming that your function could encounter an exception at any point in time. So defensive coding is this principle or this approach where the code that you write is acknowledging the fact that at some point you might be tired and you might have written some very, well, poor code. So if you design your functions with the ability to continue from a pre previous fail point during the next execution, you're off to a good start. Because think of this scenario. You query 10,000 items in a database. 10,000 is a good number. Then you write the queue message for each of those rows that you've pulled from the database to process further down the line. Now, depending on how complex your system is, you may have involved downstream service services behaving badly, or maybe networking outage, or maybe quota limits were reached. All of these, they can all affect the function at any point in time. So you need to design your functions to be prepared for that, to be defensive. So how does your code react if a failure occurs when you're inserting 5,000 of those items into a queue for processing? Do you insert them again? Hopefully not. Obviously, you must track items in a set the sets that you have completed, because otherwise you might insert them again the next time. And this double insertion can have a serious impact on your workflow. So you must make sure that your functions are and remain idempotent. Remember the previous topic? Similarly, you should think about your functions. Each time a function you create has a small memory footprint, because while the fruit footprint is usually small, if you have many functions within a function app, because remember a function app is like comprised of many, many different functions, this can lead to a slower startup time. People don't realize this. They start, they sometimes start a proof of concept. They have a dozen functions, everything is fantastic, and they decide to go on with that approach. And before you know it, they have a hundred different functions and they reach out to me and tell me, why is, is your function so slow? Wait, it's not slow. You're just loading into memory functions that you're ever gonna use, maybe once per month. Remember, one million executions is gonna cost you well, somewhere less than apparently <laughs> a cent. Does it, is it really necessary to put all of those pesky unutilized functions, especially if you don't use them unless probably maybe once per month in a single function app? No, definitely not. So if a function stores a lot of data in memory, you should also consider having fewer functions in your single app, especially when they need to have a lot of memory, because otherwise that memory is going to be cannibalized, but just having functions which never are going to be executed or never not never, but rarely ex executed. And if you do run multiple function apps on a single plan, because that's also something that you can do, 
make sure that, and you're running like this premium plan or a dedicated plan and an app service, uh, all of these functions, make sure that you remember, they're sharing the same resources allocated to the plan. So if you have one function app that has a much higher memory requirement than others, it's going to use a disproportionate amount of memory resources on each instance to which the application is going to be deployed. This Because this could, well, leave less memory available for other function apps, you might want to run a high memory uh, using function like this into its own separate hosting plan. It's all about isolation again. Uh, you should also consider whether you want to group functions with different load profiles. For example, if you have a function that processes many thousands of queue messages and another one that is called occasionally, but has high memory requirements, you may want to deploy them in a separate function app so that you they all get their own set of resources and scale independently. Um, also make sure that you reuse connections to external resources whenever possible and make sure that you avoid sharing storage accounts. All of the functions, they all require a storage account, but if you have many different functions, function apps, all connect to the same storage account, you're gonna minimize your performance because obviously you are limited to the number of IOPS, limited to the number of connections, and the more storage, the more functions are connected to the same storage account, you're gonna, well, minimize the performance that you're getting from your, from your functions. Um, also, async code, we all love async code. Use async code, make sure that you use it. But at the same time, avoid blocking calls because asynchronous programming, even though it's recommended as a best practice, especially when blocking IO operations are gonna be involved, you wanna make sure in C Sharp, you should always avoid re referencing the result property or calling the wait method on task instance because this approach leads to thread execution. And remember, Azure Functions is all about event-driven development. So those threads, you're not in control of them, right? They're given to you for an execution which has to complete ASAP. So if you plan to use HTTP or webhook bindings, you should plan to avoid port exhaustion that can be caused by improper instantiation of an HTTP client. Again, make sure that you use a factory for those rather than actually instantiating an HTTP client. Similarly, use multiple worker processes because by default, any host instance for functions uses a single worker process. So if you want to prove the performance, especially with single threaded runtimes like Python, you should configure a variable which is called functions worker processor count. And this, the purpose for this one is to increase the number of worker processes per host. The number can go up to 10. If you want to enable logging, oh, this is a good one actually. Glenn, how do you do logging right now? Do you, do you log your, your functions? I'm sure you yeah, do. Yeah, I, I, I use the, the built-in uh, application insights, but um, if you want to uh, enable logging when uh, using the Azure Functions trigger for Cosmos DB, you can, mm -hmm. um, you can locate that in the host.json file and mm -hmm. enable the traces for the, the host.trigger.cosmosdb. So that way, also, the, the triggers uh, will will show up, show up in your um, in your uh, in your traces and, and your logging. So you can view the logs in your con, uh, in your configure in your logging provider, and you can see them then under the host uh, in the category host of triggers of Cosmos DB. So that allows you to yeah to have those also that those trigger loggings within your uh, Within your, for example, application insight. So that's a that's a great trick to to also add those um, towards to on 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 your uh, your logging. And you can even uh, configure the level of level of required logging. I, I can imagine that, uh, for example, in a development environment, you want to see more logging than in a in a production environment. So that's all possible even on the host uh, triggers. And I I. I do believe this is a, like a hidden gem to also see those uh, those things appearing in within your traces. It is a hidden gem because a lot of times people have this approach where they configure the monitor container, they configure the lease container, they configure the function, and then they complain about the fact, hey, I've inserted some data over here in the monitor container and I don't see all the changes in my lease container. And they don't know why, what's going on, right? There's, there's a number of things, but having the logging on the trigger itself helps you acknowledge whether the function actually ever executed. And if it did not, then there's something that you need to be more mindful or careful about because maybe your logic or your processor or whatever else is, is incorrect, right? Um, also along the same lines, we should make sure that you create multiple function triggers for Cosmos, for Cosmos DB. When you're building serverless architectures with functions, 
it is recommended to create small functional work uh, sets that work together instead of large long running functions as you build event based serverless flows by using Azure functions trigger for cosmos db you'll run into scenarios where you want to do multiple things when whether and whenever there is a new event in particular a cosmos db um, container and if action if the actions you want to trigger are independent from one another the ideal solution would be to create one azure function trigger for cosmos db per action uh, for every single action that you want to do um, and this is going to be quite quite important in that regard. Now, as I've mentioned, we do have some troubleshooting tips. We're not going to elaborate for all of them, but long story short, a lot of times customers ask us, why are some changes missing in my trigger? Have you ever heard this one, Len? Yeah, and, and then uh, it usually pops up at the end of the chain, and then uh, people say, yeah, yeah, we're missing data, and then people start exploring uh, at, at the end. but what is usually the 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 end result um, is that the if some changes are missing on the, the the destination, it usually means that there's some error happening during the function execution runtime. So it's better to to measure which changes are being received at the ingestion point. So your yeah. your uh, your Azure function. So when your function start and not your at your destination. Um, in order to make sure that everything is processed well within um, within uh, within your function, because by default the Azure Function trigger for Cosmos DB won't retry those batch of changes if there was a an exception that was not handled by by the user. Wow. So this could be your main reason why changes do not arrive at the destination because there's yeah. just an exception happening within your within your Azure function that you're not you're you're not capturing. Yeah. So like the five year old developer in, inside me, like I would tell him, right? I would number one tell him, make sure that you have the that fantastic hidden gem for the log for the trigger. Because that that informs you that hey, the the function actually ran or not. So you're measuring as you have said, I, I think you've put it along the lines of the changes being received at the ingestion point, right? Not destination. Yeah. I think that's very well put, by the way. Uh, second, make sure you add a try catch block in your code instead of and have have loops maybe that 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 might be processing for the changes and detect any failure for a particular subset of items and whatnot and then help them handle them accordingly. And what else should you do? I, for instance, if you have a destination that's different, maybe it's a different container in Cosmos DB and you're performing maybe an upsert. I would also make sure that I'm verifying that the partition key defined uh, on both the monitor container and the destination container is the same. Because the thing with upsert uh, operations is that you could be saving multiple source items as one in destination because the configuration is uh, configuration uh, difference. Or if you ever find that some changes were not received at all by your trigger, because remember you have that log now. The most common scenario is that there is another Azure function sometimes running. And you can't imagine, if I if I only had the penny for every time somebody would reach out to me and tell me, yeah, this Azure function thing doesn't work because it is not picking up my containers. We added the log like you have said, Alex, and we're still not seeing it. Um, the first thing I would say is not to try to turn it off and on again, but I would ask them whether they can assess and assure that there's not another function running somewhere. Maybe it is a debugging Visual Studio instance somewhere on somebody's PC listening to the same container. And then yeah, happens or, more often or, than not. Yeah, or the other way around where you uh, test deployed something on Azure, it's still running there. You want to run, yeah. you want to test run it locally and you, you're not getting changes locally, but you have your function running in the cloud. So that's that's a great example actually. That happens and a lot. Just having dev and test containers uh, and dev and test environments definitely helps yeah. in that regard. Now, I'm going to skip on some of these other um, troubleshooting tips. I'm definitely not going to go as deep with them within them. But long story short, um, does it ever happen that it, it, it takes too long for the changes to be received? Uh, does it ever happen that some of the changes are repeated within your triggers? Here are some tips. If you are interested in these scenarios, feel free to reach out to us over Twitter. We're more than happy to take, we'll talk more about them. I've seen probably every single different scenario there is related to Cosmos DB. And I will definitely love to continue the conversation because there is so much more to, to this. 
Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip on the knowledge check, if that's OK with you, Glenn. I yeah, want to make sure I, that I people think... still have questions. Maybe we can take them. Yeah. Um, but I do want to remind everyone that this is actually, let's like literally skip on them and not show the actual answers here. Uh, but I do want to remind people that this is actually part of a series. So if people are interested in learning more about Cosmos DB and getting ready and getting prepared for, for, for taking the exam, I would encourage them to watch the recordings. These are all made available on YouTube as well. And you can, you can find them through the Microsoft Developer account on YouTube. And make sure that you sign up and register for the upcoming series as well. Also, if you want to learn more, I would encourage them to scan this QR code, which is going to take them to two different fantastic articles, namely the Cosmos DB trigger and bindings for Azure Functions overview article, as well as the Azure Cosmos DB trigger for Azure Functions. And Glenn, I want to show you one more trick. So if you actually open up Visual Studio Code and then you hit the control comma key or you go over here to edit and then um, actually that would be under, where's the preferences one? I don't know where the preferences are at. File preferences, there you go. And then settings, you're gonna be taken to this tab. Make sure that you scroll a bit and make sure that you add this Cascadia Cove nerd font that apparently you already have installed. And then you're gonna fix your terminal there. <laughs> Uh, I, have I, have to, I have to make sure to fix that uh, by uh, by next week, actually, and that brings us uh, uh, seamlessly through um, uh, yeah to to next week. So next week we will continue with the series, and we'll talk about uh, Cosmos DB together with uh, Azure Cognitive Search, and uh, I'll be happy to join you again uh, on this uh, show uh, to talk about cognitive search actually absolutely i'm i'm really looking forward for this conversation because we're going to effectively add some some fantastic intelligence capabilities and querying text full text querying capabilities with semantics and everything else so make sure that you stay tuned you stay up to date register for this one we're looking forward to to seeing you and hearing from you and listening and reading your questions next time as well and if you have any follow-up questions, both Glenn and myself would most likely be more than happy to take your questions offline over Twitter or whatever else have you. Uh, again, this is part of a series. The purpose here is to make sure that you get certified ASAP. So if you feel comfortable, make sure that you register and take the DP420 exam, namely on the Azure Cosmos DB Developer Specialty. And also make sure that you sign up for next week's April 19th and 20th for the Azure Cosmos DB, DB Conf. With that being said, Glenn, how was it after a long overdue period of of, uh, of a break? Did you have a break during these days? Um, well, I, I did did some moving around the house, so uh, I I did have some uh, some break. So, uh, but I, it was good to be back. So happy to have joined you today. I'm already looking forward to next week. Great to have you back, man. All right. Until I would next like time. to thank everyone for joining again. And then uh, if you have questions, reach out on Twitter and, and uh, to, uh, to both Alex and me, and we will be definitely happy to help you. Until next time, stay safe, everyone. Bye. Bye.